This is Edward October, host of October Pod on YouTube. Hear that jingle jingle? It could be Kris Kringle, or a home invader looking for an open window, a jilted lover looking for revenge, or a disgruntled co-worker hoping to spike your eggnog with arsenic. The girls of our true crime podcast are always on Santa's nice list, but the crimes they discuss are very naughty indeed. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, Jen, welcome back. Hey, Kim, ready for day two? Day two, day two, two. Two mints and one. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's a yes. Double your pleasure, <laughs> double your fun with double mint double gum. Double mint, double mint, double mint gum. Yeah. Yep. Yes, I, I'm ready. I'm ready. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to day two of the 12 Nightmares Before Christmas. If you have been a longtime listener, first time listening to the 12 Nightmares Before Christmas, here's how it works. The 12 days prior to Christmas, we present a case for you. So for 12 days in a row, you get a case. With the corresponding day is the corresponding victim count. This is our fourth year doing this now, right? Fourth is it four? annual. Fourth, fourth annual. annual. The fourth annual. Christmas. Twelve nightmares before Christmas. Yeah, it starts yep. on uh, usually starts on December fourteenth or thirteenth. Sorry, thirteenth, I believe, and it ends on Christmas Eve. So we will be with you if you need us to help you shop for Christmas. Cook. Wrap Cook. those presents. Bake cookies and clean house. All the fun joys. All the fun stuff that we do for the holidays. Just invite people over and get it all messy again. What's better than decorating your Christmas tree while listening to about serial killers? Honestly, nothing brings in the holiday. All right, Cam, for the second Nightmare Before Christmas, we are discussing the oldest unsolved case in New South Wales, Australia, and one of the country's most infamous cases. Mm. Now, most of us, not all, but most of us know about the Beaumont children disappearance. The three Australian siblings who disappeared from a beach near Adelaide, South Australia, and actually to this day are still missing. I don't think many people outside of Australia know about Marion Schmidt and Christine Chirac, who were found murdered on Wanda Beach the year before. A case the detectives simply call Wanda. Have you heard this one? I haven't. That's why I'm listening. Nope, I have not. Okay. Marion Schmidt was born on October 30th, 1948 in Germany. And in the fall of 1958, she and her family moved to Melbourne. Then later, in 1963, Marion's father, Helmut, was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease and moved the family to West Ride, Sydney. The family found a home on Brush Road, West Ride, which is a suburb of Sydney, actually. And by the next year, Helmut Schmidt had died, leaving his wife, Elizabeth, who could barely speak English, with six children, raising them all alone. The oldest, Helmut Jr., was just 16, and he took a job as an electrical mechanic to help out the family. And Marianne, being the oldest girl, would kind of be a pseudo-mom for the youngest kids. She would always watch over them, and she took charge, especially when the kids were on their school breaks. Christine Chirac was born on October 5th, 1949, and she was Marianne's neighbor on Brush Road and Rust Ride. From the minute the two met, they were inseparable. Best friends ever to be best friends. Like us. Mm -hmm. And their birthdays are kind of close to ours, too. Kind of fun. Now, the two girls had a lot of things in common, but one thing that they did have in common, which is very unfortunate, was Christine had lost her father when she was nine years old. And she had been living with her grandparents since her mother had remarried four years earlier. Both girls were very smart. They were responsible, very mature for their age. And the police would later describe the girls in a report as, quote, firm friends and, quote, Normal type of healthy Australian girls. Take that how you will, I guess. I will. I will take all it. Ameri- or I can't say all American because they're not American. They're all around all, all, good all Australian. Australian. All Australian girls, yes. 
The report added that the girls, quote, did not generally associate with boys and were not known to have regular boyfriends. On January 1st, 1965, Marianne and Christine took about a two-hour journey by train to Canala Beach. Marianne was familiar with the area because her family would go there very often when her father was still alive. Later, when their diaries were read after their death, they wrote about meeting some boys that day and even sharing a kiss with them. But they had never mentioned any of this to their families. The following day, Helmut Jr. and Marianne took the kids to Cronella Beach again. While Helmut Jr. was spearfishing and the kids were playing in the sand, Marion left for about an hour, just kind of disappeared. And when she returned, she had told her oldest brother that she had walked towards Wanda Beach, which was about a mile away. Walking a mile in the sand is really hard. It's pretty hard, it is. <laughs> really hard. A week or so later, Elizabeth Schmidt, Marianne's mother, went into the hospital to have some major operation. And while they were visiting her on January 10th, Marianne asked if she could take her younger siblings to Cronella Beach. Mrs. Schmidt approved and said, sure, that was good. Her brother, Helmut Jr. and Hans, decided to stay behind and work on the house. They wanted to paint up the kitchen and spruce it up a bit before their mother was released from the hospital. It's really sweet to do, by the Mm -hmm. way. It is. So on the morning of January 11th, Marianne packed lunches with cheese and Vegemite sandwiches or cucumber and tomato sandwiches, and each of them got a piece of fruit. She then gathered Peter, who was 10, Trixie, 9, Wolfgang, 7, and Norbert, 5. They got Christine, and they took the 8.55 a.m. train to Cronella Beach. Isn't it weird that back then that these kids at the tender age of 15, 14, or younger could just take a train by themselves mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to go somewhere? It, it yep. blows my mind in today's world. I mean, that would never go, ever. Nope. Anyway, I digress. Sorry. So while they're on the train, Christine and Marianne, Trixie will later say, that the girls started talking to a teenage boy. So they're on this train, and at one point, the boy gets off at another train stop, and the group goes onto another train and heads towards the beach. According to Alan Whitaker, who wrote the book Wanda, The Untold Story of the Wanda Beach Murders, Christine was chatting with her grandmother before they left, and she was kind of packing up to go. And she said that she hoped that they got to go to the Sandhills on Wanda Beach. Her grandmother said that she hoped they didn't take the young kids through that area, but Christine was determined to go back. And from what I gather, the Sandhills at the time was where people would sunbathe nude. Oh. There were hidden away places where people would meet to have sex. A little romance, a little romance. There's creepers. We're talking people would have sex there, you know? Not the sex. The the creepers would watch them have sex. mm -hmm. And we're straight sex, gay sex, sex, whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They'd go to their own little place to love, I guess, right? And then Bill Jenkins, who is a journalist, said in his book, As Crime Goes By, the area was, quote, a favorite haunt of male perverts who wandered about the area nude and propositioned girls who strayed into the sand dunes. Mm. So it's kind of a mystery why Christine would want to go to those parts of the beach. But then again, being a curious teenager, who knows? Mm -hmm. Totally. The group finally hit the beach at around 11 a.m. And then after playing for a bit in the sand and in the water, they ate their lunches and Christine left. She didn't pack her lunch anyway, but she just left. And she was gone for about an hour. Where she went, don't know. Nobody knows. It's not clear if she even ate, to be honest. But it is known that she brought a dollar. So she may have gotten food there. We don't know. Mm -hmm. After lunch, the weather started to change. It became very, very windy. So the water got very choppy. In fact, it was so choppy that the beach closed down for swimming. So by that time, Marianne and Christine decided to take everyone for a walk to the Wanda Sand Hills. They ditched their beach bag and started walking the mile to Wanda Beach. Then the wind really started to pick up and started to throw sand around the kids. And the kids were starting to complain that they were tired. And you can just imagine what they mm-hmm. were, how kids are. So Marianne led the group into a sheltered gully between two sand dunes and instructed 
the four kids to stay. And before they left, because they were going to go back and get their beach bags and then they were going to go home. Mm -hmm. But before she left, she instructed 10-year-old Peter and she said, you're in charge. You have to watch these kids. Just stay where you are. Nobody leave. We'll be back. We would only be gone for 20 minutes is what they told him. As they were leaving, Peter saw them going the wrong direction. So he called out to them and they said, you know, he's like, hey, you guys are going the wrong way. And the girls turned around and just kind of laughed at him. They were really giddy and excited. And then then he yelled, hey, where are you going? And both girls turned around and said, we're going mad. And then girls just kept giggling again and just walked off. They grabbed hands and walked off. Playing. Yeah. Going on their business. They were excited wherever they were going to go. They were excited Mm -hmm. and happy to be going. At about 1 p.m., Wolfgang, seven years old, left the group. And he was walking on one of the sand hills and he saw Christine and Marianne below talking and kind of walking with a boy that was, he says, about 16 years old. Said the boy looked like a surfer or a surfy and he had long, light color hair. He had very suntanned. He was a bit chubby and he had white cream on his nose. No, he was wearing pants and carrying a blue towel. Wolfgang also noticed that this teen boy had a knife. Wolfgang kind of ran to catch up with the trio, but he fell. And by the time he got up, they had already disappeared behind a sand dune. Then a while later, Wolfgang saw the same teen boy walking back. He asked the boy where the girls were, kind of called out to him and said, hey, where are the girls? And whether the teen heard Wolfgang or not, we don't know. But we do know that he never answered. He just kept walking. Around 2 p.m., an off-duty fireman was walking towards North Cronulla when he saw two teen girls walking quickly the other way. One of the girls kept looking back over her shoulder. She was walking kind of in front of the other teen, and it kind of looked like she was encouraging the other one to walk faster. Like they were scared? No, like it would be like you would be walking in front of me, and I'd kind of be, you would really want to get somewhere quick, but I was kind of not walking as fast as you wanted me to go. So I, mm-hmm. you'd look back at me and say, come on, let's go. That kind of stuff. Right. Okay. I gotcha. At 5 p.m., Peter decided that he and the younger kids should try to go home. He thought maybe Marianne and Christine would be back at the house. Maybe they forgot about them. And as they were walking back, they found the beach bags that the girls said that they were going to go get. And it was obvious that they never got them. So Peter and the kids caught the train and arrived home at about 8 p.m. When they get there, Peter tells Hans that what happened during the day, and Hans goes over to Christine's grandmother's, and then she calls the police. The police arrive by 11.40 p.m., and in no time, the police and Cronella were on the lookout for two missing 15-year-old girls. The next day, obviously, Hans went to the hospital and told his mother that the girls never came home from the beach. Elizabeth said, quote, they're gone. Hmm. Hans later said, quote, mom never believed they were missing. She knew in her heart the girls were dead. Ugh, it's heartbreaking. And it she's is. like in the hospital after major surgery and she can't do anything. Hmm. She's stuck in the hospital. The next day, about 2.30, In the afternoon, a man by the name of Peter Smith and his nephews were walking through the dunes of Wanda Beach when he saw what looked to be what? A mannequin. A mannequin. Actually, two mannequins that were partially covered in the sand. It's never a mannequin. It's never a mannequin. And when it is a mannequin, it's very rare. When he went closer, he touched the small foot that was sticking out of the sand. And then he saw a face of a young girl who was visibly deceased. Mr. Smith ran to the Wanda Surf Life Saving Club, where the police were called. The police, along with the media, of course, arrived at the scene. Both groups were taking photos and writing down how the bodies were found. Whomever killed the girls didn't try to bury them. No hole had been dug. Instead, the killer just pushed sand up over the bodies. That's awful. Marianne was lying on her right side facing the water. The Sydney Morning Herald wrote, quote, The one nearest the beach was on her side in the position as if she had fallen asleep peacefully. The crotch of Marianne's one-piece swimming suit had been cut and pulled up over her chest. Christine was lying face down with her head near Marianne's left foot. 
Her legs were slightly splayed and her white shorts had been, quote, tightly packed into the crotch. And she still had all of her jewelry on. From a police report of the surrounding area, and I just quoted all this out because I wasn't going to put it in my own words. There was just too much information. Quote, there was a drag mark in the sand extending north from the bodies and down the incline leading to the gully between the sand dunes. The drag mark extended to a point 112 feet or 34 meters from the bodies where there were dried blood stains in the sand. From this point and 20 feet, 6 meters, closer to the body was a further area of blood covered by sand. Blood spots were present on the top of the stand between the two positions and also on top of the sand for the whole length of drag marks to the body. At intervals of about 10 feet, 3 meters, along the drag mark, there were heavier concentrations of blood, consistent with a person who has dragged the body up the slope, having paused at these positions. Mm -mm. The morning of January 13th, the postmortem started. Christine had, quote, suffered a fractured skull by using a blunt instrument, possibly a piece of wood, rock, water pipe, or similar instrument. She had also been stabbed seven times. Quote, one wound by the right shoulder blade, a stab wound behind the right ear, stab wounds on the right hand side of her back close to her waist, one stab wound on the right side of the back at the base of the neck, and one stab wound on the right side of the back of the neck. It was also noted that there were two small prick marks on the right side of the back just below the other wounds one small nick below the neck wounds, an abrasion to the chin, plus both eyes were badly bruised. Hmm. She had two scratch marks on the lower leg of the side of the calf, six parallel cuts on the front of the neck, and some of the wounds were so deep it showed the knife pierced her lungs and liver. Hmm. Pretty violent attack. The pathologist also found that Christine had a blood alcohol level of 0. .015. That's maybe one glass of beer, which is weird because Christine's mother said that Christine didn't even like the smell of alcohol and never even touched the stuff. Hmm. Now it's been shown that microorganisms can produce alcohol in deceased bodies and that this process occurs within a few days of death. When an unpreserved body is stored at room temperature, which is 65 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 20 Celsius and more rapidly at higher temperatures. So it doesn't necessarily mean she drank anything. It could be just a natural body response, a red herring, if you will. I've heard that before. Mm -hmm. Marianne suffered, quote, two stab wounds to the outside of the left arm, two stab wounds to the inside of the left arm, two stab wounds to the side of the left breast, one stab wound to the back of the right side, three stab wounds in the middle of the back, three stab wounds to the right side of the back, one stab room in the left side of the back, and one stab wound to the left shoulder blade. A large deep laceration to the front of the throat, one scratch on the high left, on the left thigh, about two inches below the swimming suit mark, one stab wound had penetrated her left breast, which traveled between the two ribs and penetrated her heart, which was most likely the cause of death. That's 14 stab wounds. She'd been stabbed 14 times if you lost count. Both girls did show signs of rape. It was also reported that the weapon used to kill the girls may have been a stiletto style of knife, which is a long slender blade that tapers to a point with a half inch wide blade. It's sharp on one side and serrated on the other. Police think that Marianne was attacked first. The man stabbed her 14 times. And when Christine tries to escape, The killer runs after Christine and then catches her, then takes something, a blunt object, and starts bashing her skull in. He then takes the knife and stabs her. After the attack, he drags her body back to where Marianne was. This is when the police believe that he raped both of them, and they don't even know if the girls were dead or if they were actively dying at the time of rape. Bill Jenkins wrote in the Daily Mirror that around 5.30 p.m. the day before, which is after the police had found the body. He was there. He somehow got into the crime scene because he was a very popular journalist at the time and he knew police. 
Mm -hmm. The police led him next to the crime scene and he was watching the police dig with their hands to uncover the girls' bodies. And when Marianne's face was uncovered, one of the young officers said, quote, Oh my God, look at that. Her head's almost been cut off. Oh. Her throat was slashed that deep. So I don't have to tell you that Australia was shocked by these brutal deaths of the, these two young girls. And the media, of course, was on top of it. Many of the journalists were given leaked information by the police, like Bill Jenkins. And one of the lead investigators made a statement on a local TV station. And just it caused panic. We feel this man is a compulsive killer who must stab and have sexual intercourse with the victim as an overall part of the act. Yeah, that wouldn't cause panic at all Mm -mm. on national TV. Mm -mm. The New South Wales police launched one of the biggest searches ever. The police commissioner asked for anyone with any information to come forward, and police started questioning any youths in the area, especially any white male matching the description that Wolfgang gave. You know, the, the 16, sun-tanned, blonde, long blonde hair, surfy. Mm-hmm. At one point, two boys by the name of Jim and Ted came forward, and they said that they were the boys that were with Christine and Marianne on January 1st. They just said that the girls were both very shy, and they all just sat around and talked about what teenage kids talk about, music, movies, that kind of stuff. And of course, they were cleared. Police brought in a front loader and a sand sifter, and they went through 3,000 square yards of sand, and they dug four feet down around the area where the girls' bodies were found. About 14 feet from where the bodies laid, a blood-stained piece of kitchen knife blade was found. And to this day, the police are not able to tell, well, maybe this day, but nothing's been tested. The police were not able to tell if the blood was human or not. Police did get some leads. Some girls claimed that they were out on the sand dunes when they saw a naked man. But remember, lots of illicit stuff was happening in the area. Two other girls from Tasmania had complained about a man matching Wolfgang's description about the, like the surfy that was getting too familiar with them. He was making sexual advances to them and just being relatively creepy. They actually went and told one of the lifeguards and he kicked the man off the beach. Joggers reported seeing a man hiding behind some corrugated metal sheets, and he was spying on people. It was a creeper, but none of the leads ever panned out. On January 20th, both girls were laid to rest on the same day, but they had separate ceremonies. Flowers and condolences were sent from all over the country, and every type of media, of course, was there to cover it. After a month with no solid leads, a $10,000 reward was offered for any information leading to the arrest of the killer. Now, I always like to give you the inflation numbers, you know, the equivalent Mm -hmm. of what it would be today, but... (laughs) On February of 1966, Australia stopped using the English pounds system for money and went to Australian dollars. And to be honest, that's just too much math. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't handle trying to figure it out. One of the TV shows that I did watch on this to get some of this information said it was about $20,000 of Australia money, but I think this show was in the 90s. I'm not even for sure, or early 2000s. I don't know, but it's somewhere over that. When I actually put in $10,000 for today, I think it came out to be 143000 or something. It's messed up. We'll just go with 20000 How's that? <laughs> okay. It's a lot of money. And honestly, right now, it's, I believe it's still out there. It's, you can still get it. So let's go on. Enough about math. It's depressing. A leading forensic psychologist said that the killer was most likely schizophrenic and warned that, quote, having committed one sadistic crime, the so-called personality will have a fierce bloodlust, which caused what? More panic. panic. Mm -hmm. Panic. 
Police women were sent to Cronulla and the Wanda Beach, and they were put in bathing suits, and they were to mix into the crowds in hopes of finding the killer. But nothing, nothing, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. To this day, with 52 boxes of evidence, statements, and over 3,000 interviews later, the police were not any closer to solving the murders of Marianne Schmidt and Christine Chirac. But some people do know who the killer is, so we're going to go through some theories here, just briefly. The first suspect is a man by the name of Alan Bassett. He was a schizophrenic who was convicted of the rape and murder of Carolyn Orphan, 19, of Wollongong. She lived in Wollongong. He was then sentenced to life in a psychiatric prison. Now, Detective Sergeant Sess Johnson firmly believed that Bassett killed the girls, but he never really had any solid, solid evidence. But what he did have was a painting that Bassett sent him that was entitled A Bloody Awful Thing. Mm. Now, Johnson believed that there was clues in the painting that proved that Bassett was the killer. Some of the clues that he solved in the painting was bloody grass or a broken knife blade in a girl's body. Now, Johnson was able, never, ever, ever able to prove it, that Bassett was the killer. And many of his peers really don't agree with him about Bassett. Kind of weird, but Johnson did write a book about this case, and it was never published. Because as he was delivering the manuscript, he was hit by a car. Uh oh And he died. Alan Bassett was released in 1995, and to tell you the truth, I can't find anything on him online. Like, from where we are, even with my VPN, I couldn't find much about him. I wonder why. But he never, he always said he didn't do it. One of the top contenders of the Wanda Beach killer is convicted child killer Derek Percy. In 1969, pedophile Derek Percy was arrested for the murder of 12-year-old Javon Toey. And at his trial in 1970, he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. And he was then incarcerated in a correctional facility in Ararat, Victoria. I thought this was kind of a neat little saying. They said he was there at the governor's pleasure, which means that it was indefinite. Yeah. That, yeah. But I like that. We learned that. It's I've... very formal. The governor's yes. pleasure. <laughs> um, yeah, right. He did die there in 2013, and he is also the longest serving prisoner of all time, 44 years, if my math is correct. A th this is why they kind of think they believe he's something. He was something. Authorities found a journal in a cell describing acts of violence, I guess, and drawings Mm -hmm. of some of his unusual sexual fetishes for young children, oh. like cropophilia, urophilia, cannibalism. Yeah. Lovely. And then later, in 2007, they would find 35 boxes filled with journals, maps, drawings, and newspaper clippings with plans on how to torture and mutilate children. Those are all-around nice guy. But he was probably insane, to be honest. Yeah, I And think so. here's why they think that he did it. Derek Percy was 16 when Christine and Marianne were killed, and he kind of fit the description that Wolfgang gave. And there was a very high probability that he was on Wild Wanda Beach that day. Mm -hmm. Percy loved sailing, and it seemed like there was some sort of championship in Botany Bay on the day the girls were mur murdered. And from what I've read, Botany Bay is right on the edge of the sand hills of Wanda Beach. And if he were to have gone to this event, he would have stayed with his grandmother, who lived about a mile away from Marianne and Christine in West mm. Ride. He would have also, if he was going down there, he may have possibly ridden the same train that Marianne and Christine rode. Like, remember they talked to a boy on the train? Mm, uh -huh. It could be him. It, it's all coincidence. It's never proved. But he was also a suspect in many other unsolved murders, including the Beaumont children. Like, really? They can put him there, too. There's like nine murders that he's could be linked to. I'm actually going to try to do a full episode of him after we get back. He's interesting, to say the least. Interesting. Yes, I mm -hmm. would say so. The final suspect is one that we've already discussed, and that's Ooh. Christopher Wilder. Remember the Ooh. beauty queen killer? Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. Yeah. In 1969, Wilder's ex-wife turned him into the police as a suspect because he Mm. fit the profile. Remember, he was Mm -hmm. a surfer. He was blonde. Wouldn't say he was chubby, but he was, you know. A little bit. A little bit. Mm -hmm. He had more meat on his bones. He was in good. He was fit, but he wasn't skinny, skinny like Derek Percy was. Mm -hmm. I've seen pictures of Derek Percy and he was a skinny guy. Yeah. So he was a blonde surfer. And he was violent, very violent. Oh. Two years prior to the, mur- the murders in 1963, remember he was accused of rape of that 13-year-old girl uh-huh. that he was able to make his way out of that little problem. But the sad thing is, after his wife turned him in in 1969, it took eight months for the police to check him out. I mean, seriously, eight months when they already knew he had been accused of rape of a young girl before because he right. was 18 at the time of the rape. So, yeah. And by the time that they did go to check him out, he had already left for the United States. And that's when he was starting his crime spree here. So mm. retired New South Wales detective inspector Ian Watterson, who was in charge of the Wander Beach murders, cold case, he believes that Christopher Wilde, quote, stands out far above anyone else. That makes him a red hot suspect in my eyes because of his sexual deviance his propensity for violence, and he was in Sydney at the time, hanging out at the beach. It all points to Wilder. But like Percy, we know Wilder is dead. So we may never really know who killed them. Police do have a small amount of semen that was taken by the pathologist from the girls. I believe they got it from the shorts of Christine. I'm not, I thought I read that. I'm not for sure. Maybe someday they're going to be able to get DNA and find the killer. There's still hope that there are people out there who know who murdered Marianne Schmidt and Christine Chirac. And like I said before, I believe the reward is still available. So if you know something, it's not too late. Wow. So call and find out. What amazes me is they still have it after all these years. They have the DNA and they could Mm -hmm. do it. But sometimes, but I guess. Uh, like some of the cases we've covered, if they only have a finite amount of that and they waste it, then it's gone and it's gone forever. So, but may, don't it, you think it's better to try and fail? Well, I, yeah, but fail meaning like if it doesn't, I don't know. You know, it's kind of funny because, you know, they had something that they believed to be the killer's blood. And I'm, I apologize. I, it was I read it last week and of course I forgot about it. But they like couldn't determine the blood type even. They like when what I was reading, they're like, they believe the blood type was these are A, B, A, B, or O. I'm like, though, that's, I mean, I know that there's a large amount of blood types, but those are the most common. So I think there's only, there's not that many. There's a lot, but there's some that are more common than most. Mm -hmm. If you're new to the podcast, you know that unsolved cases drive me nuts. So even if they pr- pretty much know it, it I don't well, know. Well, there's no doubt in my mind they wanted to go to Wanda Beach to see a boy or something. At their age? Of course. Yeah. Come on. And I wonder if they wanted just not to be disrespectful or anything, but at 15, I was curious about what the male body looked like. And we had books that were readily available. You know what I mean? So maybe they mm-hmm. thought going to a nude beach was kind of funny or fun oh, yeah. or okay, curiosity sake yeah giggly, i mean there's no shame in that girls. at all yeah. yeah no shame at that whatsoever i don't i'm just there's I know something it had something with a boy they of course were either did. gonna meet another boy or i don't know and that but chris the chris guy was a surfer guy did you see a picture of him yeah he's sandy blonde hair and if he was a surfer and he was out in the sun all the time mm-hmm. it would have gotten really blonde Mm-hmm. But is he kind of handsome? I know yeah. he's a killer. So see, yeah. they, they, he could have flirted with them. And He would have been about 20, I think, at the time. 20 right. older. But you have to remember that Wolfgang was seven. Some of his descriptions kind of changed. Not his description, but kind of things changed a lot when the police spoke with him. Mm-hmm. And who's to even say that the guy that he saw on the beach was the same guy? Right. We don't know. Especially... You know, he just by chance walked over a sand dune and saw the girls speaking with some Mm -hmm. anybody surfer dude yeah and i'm sure there's lots of surfer dudes there you know yeah yeah and the reason why interesting never heard of it it interesting yeah Mm -hmm. i never heard of it didn't hear about it until um i was researching for christopher wilder and it's just 
it's amazing. When now with the world being so small, mm-hmm. we, should, we should know about all these. We should. And we are slowly getting there since we've been doing this, right? One case at a time. One story at a time. But anyway, that's Nightmare 2. Stay tuned for tomorrow. Three, three, three. And I just want to add, if you do know anything about the Wanda murders, please call the New South Wales police Mm -hmm. and tell them Cam and I sent you. Yes. Let them know. Yeah. They'll be like, what? Who? All right, yeah, Jen. Yeah, well, all right. I will see you tomorrow. Same bat yes. time, same bat channel. But until we then, we'll be here. Merry Christmas. Remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye-bye. Love ya. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Jen. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Fertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at WeTalkOfDreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash our true crime podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya.